set out to write a memoir. Um, I started off wanting to write a bunch of policy papers on how to grease the skids for women to reach the top of a company. And then coming out of the pandemic, I wanted to make it easier for our frontline workers to be able to do whatever they do and still have a, a support structure for them to take care of their families. That's where I started. Uh, but then everybody who read my policy papers said, hey, nobody's going to read these policy papers unless you inform it with the arc of your own life. So this book resulted from those conversations. So this is not a tell-all memoir. This is not filled with stories. This is about stories that inform the two issues that I'm talking about. So this is a different sort of a memoir, and I hope you enjoy reading it. When I talk about, um, you know, I didn't come here because of persecution or because I was fleeing uh, problems in the country of my birth. I was just talking about the entry mode and the reason for coming to the United States. But once you come into the United States, whatever the reason was that you left your country of birth, you are an immigrant into the country and you go through all the teething pains of getting to know a new culture, understanding everything about it and assimilating into it in whatever shape or form you choose to assimilate. And so I didn't have the entry pains that many people have, but once I got in, I had to go through the assimilation process. I think in many ways it was easier for me because I was at Yale, it was a structured environment. Uh, and even though at that time there wasn't a big support structure for international students, there were other international students who helped out. So I somehow made it. Uh, other people may not have that infrastructure, may not have family support, may not have a friend's network to help out. So the assimilation process is very similar for many of us. We just have different support structures. I think once I came to the country, I, do, I felt that the country did me a big favor by allowing me to come into the country. For whatever reason, that's how I felt. And I felt that I had to prove in this country that I was worthy to be a member of this country. So I always worked hard in the United States. Had I stayed in India, I would have continued to work hard. So hard work is in my DNA. And I worked hard through my entire life because I wanted them to say, she did good by the United States. I wanted India to say she did good by India because she didn't bring any disrepute to the country. And I wanted my family to say she never ever let down the Krishnamurti family, which is my family of birth. And then subsequently the Nui family. So I had all of these uh, imaginary responsibilities that I took on. Once I finished my career at PepsiCo and I retired, it's no longer about achieving anything. It's about giving back so much that was given to me, my community, the state, the country, uh, the US gave me so much. And my job right now is to give back. And I give back here in the US and I give back in India. I've rebuilt all of the labs and all the educational institutions that I studied in from high school or middle school to college to IIM. And in the US, giving back to every educational institution that my husband, me, and my kids have been involved in. Uh, and so, Right now, we're in the giving back phase, both in terms of money and time. Earlier days, it was just doing a good job and a feeling like you accomplished something. Let me go back to the characterization of my book. I actually think it's a realistic book. It's not an optimistic book because sometimes people write books about just make a checklist and your life is going to be okay. Just do A or B or C and bingo, your life is going to be great. That's not how it is. When you're juggling work, family, uh, other pressures that you're facing, your own hopes, dreams, and aspirations, it's a lot to cope with. And there isn't a manual which says, if you have to worry about options A, B, and C, this is the checklist. There isn't a manual for life. Life unfolds and you have to really figure out different pathways at every point in time, the trade-offs virtually every day that you have to make. And so for me to suggest that there is a manual would be uh, foolhardy. So all that I say is realistically, there isn't a manual, but what I can tell you is what kind of support structures we should be building to reduce the stress on families. I think we have to sit back and say, 
Lots has changed. If I go back to when I entered PepsiCo in 1994 with zero women CEOs, in 2021, there are 41 women CEOs. Again, everything is optimistic or really have we made progress? Optimistically, we've got 41. That's a big number, but it's only less than 9% of the Fortune 500 CEOs. So there's lots of room for women to grow and ascend as CEOs. The other part is being a CEO is not the only hope, dream, and aspirations of a lot of women. Women want to be entrepreneurs. Women want to start companies. Women want to run NGOs. Women want to be in other positions in society. That's okay. All that we're saying is whatever you want to do, we want to make sure that there are more tailwinds than headwinds when it comes to work and family and the integration of the two. Men hold most of the positions of power. And it's very, very important that they come to the table to talk about how do we make it easier for all family builders, not just women, all family builders to integrate work and family. Because today we are in a war for talent. And if we don't include women in our talent base, because women are getting 70% of the valedictorians in high school, they're graduating in college in 10 points more than men. Uh, in STEM disciplines, they have one whole point of GPA more than the men do. Uh, they are getting the majority of professional degrees, even in engineering degrees. MIT is 47% women. Caltech, Georgia Tech are over 30% women. So I'm talking about women being a potent force in the economy. As somebody said, they represent the biggest emerging market opportunity in the United States. And if you really are in a war for talent, you should want these women to come into your company. And if that's the case, let's find a way to make all of the family responsibilities equal between the men and the women. And let's find a way to make it easier for women to come into the workplace and retain their jobs as opposed to dropping out in large numbers. So I think men in power have to start discussing these issues with a lot more heart than just saying, oh God, it's a, a feminist issue. I think this is an issue that has to be approached like an economist. It's a resource that has to be allocated in the economy to improve the GDP of the country. In fact, Raju, the McKinsey studies have been spectacular on what would happen if more women were deployed in the, in the economy. The growth that the GDP will go through is really, really impressive. Why is it all the analysis has been done and scored, but we ignore it? companies appoint a DNI head and they say, okay, it's done. I've appointed a DNI head. Nobody can question me now because they, I can point to the fact that I have a head of diversity and inclusion. But what people forget is that diversity is a mathematical number. Are you diverse? On what metrics are you diverse? Do you have ethnic diversity, gender diversity, racial diversity, all that stuff? But inclusiveness is a state of mind, is a emotion. It's are you going to make everybody feel welcome and included? And that requires deep involvement by all people in power to make sure that you identify bad behavior that's not inclusive, nip it in the bud, and model the right behavior. And if you put a diversity and inclusion officer, they can do it. It's got to be a responsibility and a tone at the top. And boards have to ask CEOs, hey, why are your metrics not trending in the right way? Um, are you really looking for the right talent? And those that come in, what's the retention number look like? Uh, how many are getting developed and promoted? Let me see the organization health scores. Do diverse people feel included? Everybody, but particularly diverse people if they are underrepresented in the country. I think these are the kinds of questions that boards should be asking with a caveat. I think board agendas now are getting more and more overloaded with issues related to cybersecurity, pandemic management, all the audit committee requirements. Um, and I think what we have to think about is, do boards have to meet for a longer period in time? Do boards need to have more committees, increase the size of the board? What can they drop? So this is a very difficult discussion that needs to be had because as the world has gotten more complex, as companies have gotten bigger, boards have remained small and still meeting on the same agenda they've done in the past. One of two things has to happen. 
for us to really make boards uh, think about diversity and inclusion in a wholly different way. Either boards change their mindset and they start to embrace these notions and really uh, lean in to hold CEOs and companies accountable, or we have to add people to the board with this new skill set. Or third, we have to refresh the board. Uh, you know, maybe put term limits. I don't know. Whatever we have to do, we have to refresh the board. I think most important, Raju, boards should be shaped for the future, not stacked based on the past. Very often, there are people who are just in boards because they've been on boards for 20, 25 years. And uh, more, uh, one of the biggest um, ahas for me is you constantly got to think of your board in terms of shaping it based on the future needs of the company. Uh, very often, you don't think of the board that way because there's no mechanism to renew the board in US corporate governance laws. Uh, so I think we have to rethink how we uh, uh, reshape the board. That's why I use the word juggle, work-life juggling. Uh, you're constantly trading off priorities. You're constantly, you know, you've got multiple balls in the air and you hope nothing drops. Um, it's not easy. I mean, it's not easy for a stay-at-home mom who's juggling so many home priorities. It's not easy for a working woman without a family who's also juggling other priorities, could be a aging parent or could be a relative they're looking after, or, uh, you know, in a work environment that's hostile. So everybody's juggling all the time. But when you include work, uh, home, and children, if you put all three together, that's a lot to juggle because everybody wants you full time. And as you reach uh, sort of, if you look at the CEO job as N, N minus two position, where there's typically, typically about 30 or 40 people, and many of them vying for the top job, all bets are off. At that time, it's a, it's a slog. And whether you like it or not, to hold your job in the senior levels, you've got to work extra hard because in those levels, it's either up or out. And to compete with the others and contribute and be noticed is a tremendous investment of time and energy. And that's why I think the hope is by the time you reach that level, your kids are already going to college. So you can have all the time to focus on the job. I think women today are held to a different standard. They're too loud or too soft. They're too emotional, not in, emotional enough. They're too strident or they're too weak or uh, passive. Every possible badge is given to women. And um, it's just disconcerting because you can feel it. Um, um, you get these badges. Uh, you can see the looks among men when women dress a certain way. Um, and that's the environment we live in, whether we like it or not. And that ranges from every uh, business event you go to, social event you go to, sometimes even in boardrooms. Uh, you know, when I changed my clothing and went to more tailored outfits, I mean, it wasn't, uh, uh, you know, high fashion. It was just elegant corporate outfits. A board member told me that he found me intimidating, whatever that means. I don't know, I don't care, but the fact of the matter is somebody actually said they found me intimidating. Now, is that good or bad? If a man shows up in a business suit, is he intimidating? I don't think so. Why is it when I showed up in a well-tailored business suit, I was intimidating? The fact of the matter is that there's always a badge, there's always a tag placed on women. And I think what we have to do is stop that, stop defining women versus the ideal worker of the past, who was a man. And um, if you constantly compare today's you know, woman CEO to the ideal worker who is the man, I think women are gonna get a raw deal. And I think we have to redefine it to say, the ideal CEO, the ideal worker, the ideal executive of today is whoever's doing the job the best. And we're not gonna constantly define them versus somebody else who's our image from the past. When you're a CEO, you're always um, thinking about weighty things about the company, either a decision you've got to make or data you're looking at, which could have an impact in the quarter or the year. You're in possession of a lot of data. 
And you have to make sure that whether it's at home or uh, anywhere, you don't leave the data for people to see by accident and then blurt it out. People don't realize it's highly confidential, even family members. And they, in turn, mention it to somebody. And to be extra, 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 extra careful, um, I would be almost hiding my bags under a cupboard or something like that because I wanted to make sure that there was never any paper left around the house that somebody might look at and say, mom, are you working on this? So you don't want to discuss everything with your husband because there's only so much you can discuss that are problems. You also want to have a normal conversation with your husband. Um, but more importantly, I think families are so vested in you. If I shared my problems with my husband, he then starts to have a negative perception of the person that I said something negative about. And I don't want that. So I stopped discussing anything negative with my husband. Um, and my kids, I was super careful because one was already in business school and the other was in college. And I did not want uh, any uh, of my stuff to get to them for fear that they would say something. So I became uh, a more, much more cocooned when I became a CEO. And you can't discuss anything with other people either, except in generalities. Um, so, you know, the role of the CEO, you've got to have incredible courage. You've got to have an incredible backbone. And you've got to have incredible um, fortitude of some kind to be a CEO. Because um, there aren't too many people you can talk to. There aren't too many people you can vent with. You have got to have your own um, strength and call on it in the toughest moments. When I was doing it, I did it because I was clueless about that topic and I wanted to learn more about it. First is get into the details. Don't sign something unless you understand it. And if you're confronted with a problem, really get into the details before you go to the big picture. Zoom in and then zoom out. Uh, and third, have humility. If you don't know something, feel free to reach out and talk to people because what happens is typically you say, God, if I brought in a, an expert to help me, they might realize how little I know about the subject. Big deal. You can't know everything about everything. Bring in the expert. Let them coach you in the cocoon of that expert and you sitting in your office, you might be able to ask more questions than you could in a bigger meeting, than you can in a bigger meeting. So I honestly believe that getting the experts in, sitting down one-on-one -on -one and um, learning everything there is to learn uh, is a good thing. Uh, I spent several weeks in China after I became CEO. And I wanted to understand the country because it represented such a big opportunity. Yet, you know, the way we had to operate was in China, for China, with China. And I wanted to understand that better. So I went there with some members of my team and spent multiple weeks. But I was also told that you don't go to China and spend multiple weeks without taking some time to understand the country, its history, its political structure, the players, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So over a period of six months, my team designed a um, training program for me. So every two weeks, a different speaker would come into my office, could be a professor, could be a China expert. They would come into my office and give me a two to three hour seminar session on China, along with a bunch of readings I had to do. And then the next person would come in, the next person would come in. So they put a whole curriculum together. And the final session was Henry Kissinger coming in and wrapping everything together to tell me the integrated picture on China. Some people might have said, you mean you don't know anything about China that you have to go through this kind of education? Au contraire. I was giving respect to the country and its culture and its history in saying that you don't go and spend six or eight weeks in a country without really understanding what that country is about. No CEO does this, you know, spend that kind of time in a country. Uh, I wanted to make sure that I was a CEO who was going in with some knowledge, some knowledge, little sliver of knowledge, but some knowledge so I could appreciate the country a lot more. And I'd encourage other, other leaders to do the same. You know, Raja, I look at my 12 year tenure as CEO, and you can either say I ran three, four year tenures or two six year tenures, because I look at the first six years of my CEO ship. It was navigating through the financial crisis creating a more international PepsiCo because we were more 
US focus, had to build out the international footprint and addressing the North American bottling uh, relationship, which was not particularly great at that time. So six years of heavy lifting on that particular front, along with putting in performance and purpose. And then the second six years was you know, delivering performance from the expanded core, both geographically from a product perspective, and then not having to expend as much energy as I did on addressing the North American bottling issues. And so I think that, uh, you know, when you look at these two eras, I wish I didn't have the financial crisis. I wish I didn't have the bottling crisis to deal with because so much more could have been done with the company. But I also realized that, you know, foolhardy, everybody goes through crises. I mean, my successor is dealing with COVID. So every person goes through some sort of a crisis in their tenure as a CEO. Again, the mark of a good CEO is how do you navigate through these crises and constantly think about, am I creating a stronger company as I come out of the crisis? And as long as you have an eye towards the long term as opposed to how do I navigate for the quarter or for my duration as CEO and somehow come out looking good, I don't care what happens to the company after me, you're okay. That's what I was singularly focused on. I think uh, the most important thing with the book is if you choose to write a memoir in particular, um, it's wonderful to put your story down on a piece of paper, but it also is painful because it brings back memories from the past. Uh, it um, uh, makes you think about all your past choices. So it's a, it's a period of introspection and reflection. Be prepared for that. Second, while you're early in your career, especially if you're ascending, create a digital record of your entire life. Every speech, every photograph, every um, piece of uh, tape that's available on awards you might have gotten, whatever. Collect all of that. Whether you write a book or not, just collect all that information because you never know when you're going to use it. The third is don't write a book just to celebrate yourself. Write a book with a message. Write a book with a plan of action. Write a book about how you're going to give back. Because at the end of the day, a lot of people write memoirs. They are informative, no question about it. But all of them would have a shelf life that's longer if then it leads to some tangible action. I think that um, it's very easy for me to say, we have to do this. We have to think about a care infrastructure and then say, I've written the book, I've done the book tours, it's done. I want to take it a step further. Again, I want to give back of my time and money. There are so many organizations that have been working on researching, scoring, prioritizing all the different initiatives to provide a care network. I want to bring them all together, figure out a way that we can intelligently work together to put in place a care network. And it may be a, a bunch of alternatives. It may be home care, community care, you know, organized child care in companies, whatever it is, it's gonna be a patchwork, a quilt of care options. But I want us to at least have a, a, a manual of care options, the cost, the benefits. So when people are thinking about implementing it, they can fall back on this approach to care. But I can't do it myself because I'm not a policy person. I'm more of a, here's the problem. This is how we need to go about addressing it. I need to bring all the policy experts together to say, how do we prioritize it? How do we fund it? So I want to take this to the next level of progress so people don't say, hey, she wrote a book, so big deal. So many people have written a book. I want to actually make life better for those who are struggling so much with this care conundrum.